I'm a hypnotherapy trainer. I'm from a legal background and I was a trainer in the law profession for a long time. And then I went on a hypnotherapy course to learn NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Yeah. But they had in, uh, hypnotherapy with it. And I was so enamoured by what hypnotherapy could do so quickly that I stopped what I was doing to everybody's disdain and absolute shock and um, stopped what I was doing and I opened a hypnotherapy practice and then General Hypnotherapy Standards Council realised I was a trainer and asked me to train people in hypnotherapy and now I train only advanced hypnotherapists those who were already trained and I've trained them to advanced level like Paul and his so is that specifically in NLP that you're training them in? Well, NLP is hypnosis with your eyes open. And a lot of people in the commercial world know about NLP and utilise its tactics in a marketing sense. And the media do as well to sway opinion. And so I always say that I de-hypnotise people because we've already been hypnotised. So I take away the programming that is stopping them from living a fabulous life. So we looked up about your Enneagrams and they did a quiz, didn't you? Some of you did a quiz to decide uh -huh. which personality trait. So I, I was a one, I was a perfectionist which really surprised me. Is I, I am simplifying this, Kate, though it's really complex. I mean, yeah. as you know, the book that I did was so complex that even Paula had a hard time with it. So I've simplified the book, and the book is a lot simpler now, and it's called The Enneagram Soul Types. So this was kind of called The Imprint of Your Soul, because it's at a soul level these personality types and it was never intended to be any sort of a personality testing tool. In AD 375 a Greek philosopher called Evagrius developed what he called the eight evil thoughts and it's basically how we uh, succumb to the dark side when we're under terrible duress we all have our go-to thing and we kind of overdo whatever our personality type is and so he developed these um, philosophized about these eight ways we descend and um, so that we're not no longer acting in our highest good and then over the years uh, Pope Gregory he stole them and called them the uh, seven deadly sins and so uh, all of those seven deadly sins, there are nine actually, but those seven deadly sins were more like um, how do we behave when we're under terrible, terrible strain? Like if we were um, an eight type, for example, we would be the one that was the angry one, always wanted to blame somebody, but we want to blame somebody so we can put it right, you know? So there's good and bad, if you like, aspects to every single personality so you can't pick a good one so that they've evolved into personality types because of our sin if you like the seven deadly sins but it's also um originally was about our childhood wound how we got incredibly hurt up to the age of seven beyond seven we've kind of got other things active but up to the age of seven we were highly influenced and we get incredibly hurt. It's like our world shatters. The childhood wound becomes part of our development. And then we've got our poisons and our passions. I mean, lots of people don't like a certain thing, but if we're a certain personality type, um, such as a nine, for example, a nine, um, very balanced type, quite even-tempered, but if... Um, lots of people would know that perhaps overeating isn't a good thing but with the nine if you go there whoo, that's a slippery slope down you know other people would say yeah it's not not good to overeat mm -hmm. um, and excess with the seven for example fun-loving happy-go-lucky 
usually on the good side. But when a seven overdoes the <laughs> they're the drug takers. They're the ones that get really addicted to having a good time until it doesn't become a good time anymore, you know? So um, you see how all of these are based on our um, all-pervasive sin, if you like. So the sin of the eight would be wrath, you know, the wrath of God, so angry about something. And um, we all have um, our particular way. So some people that would um, feel angry wouldn't necessarily display that anger, they, they would withdraw instead because they might be terrified of what's going to happen should they become angry. And other people might, instead of getting angry, they'll comply, they'll agree to anything because they just want you to stop going on. So the way that we react under duress and whatever kind of sin we gravitate to is part of what then becomes this personality testing tool. So come on then, somebody volunteer what you are. So we know that- I did mine, I did mine twice, I got one and five. Okay. <laughs> I'm, so. I'm gonna to hope to reveal to you that they're rubbish, these online tests. All right, okay. It's so very complex. And yeah. um, also you doing it yourself is really a bad thing because you, <laughs> we like to think we know ourselves pretty well, but if you then run your answers by somebody else that loves you and knows you very well, you'd probably get different answers. So um, the way we, we have an internal experience, as you all know, and an external experience, and sometimes how, we're, how we think we're behaving internally from our own viewpoint is quite different to how somebody else perceives us to be. So a one and a five you say? Yeah. I saw bits in me in both of them to be honest. Yes and that's where it gets confusing isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because um, you know you take this test and you think okay once somebody's got their number, it seems to me nowadays that people get their number, like doing a, a Facebook quiz or something, think, okay, that's the end of it, I know what I am now, I'm a five, Woom. Mm. But it's so very much more than that. Because if you are a five, you would be somebody that, uh, under stress, under an immense amount of stress, would think unconsciously, if I just gather enough information, everything will be all right. So regards the virus, for example, you'd probably be thinking, okay, let's get the data, let's look at the graphs, let's really understand how it affects the body, let's just get as much information as possible so that we can sort this thing out. Let's, um, let's really analyze this. So a five, for example, <coughs> without wanting to pick on anybody particular, but thank you for volunteering. Mm. <laughs> the five in particular, and, and the five's very best. They are yeah. the inventors of the world. They are the visionaries. They gather all the information that's ever been, and they produce, they put their own two penneth in it, and they create such wonderful things. They're the ones that do something that's never been done before because they've absorbed all the information, they're the visionaries. But on the other end of the scale, because there's a, um, a good and a bad side, if you like, mm. the polar opposites to every single number. So when we've got the visionary of the, all the information, the inventors and all the wonderful people, we've got uh, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, Sherlock Holmes, Einstein, um, but we've also got Ebenezer Scrooge and we've got the owl out of, um, I'm going to go fictional, the owl out of Winnie the Pooh. So we've got all the, all the intellect acting from the head all the time, the visionary. But on the other side of the scale, we've got the obsessive recluse. We've got the people that hoard and collect things and have their safety invested in gathering stuff. 
you know, if I have enough stuff unconsciously, if I have enough stuff, enough information, then I'll feel safe. Mm -hmm. So, um, once we look at the um, behaviour at both extremes, because we, we want to be the we want to all be the positive side of every single number. But as soon as we start to accept, and it often takes a few days or something somebody says to us before we realise, oh, remember that time when that happened? And yeah, I did do that a bit. Yeah, yeah, I did think um, I could solve it by doing this and it didn't work, did it? No. Mm. We kind of begrudgingly start to, to mm. recognise those sides. And so with the, the one, uh, the one <clears throat> at the best would be highly principled, want everything to be right. And the ones are the ones that are the rule makers, that make it better for everybody. Find the best way of doing it and do it right and want everybody else to do it right. But on the other end of the scale, they are the self-righteous OCD people. Who go over the top? Not me, Jenny. I thought that gave me that. I'm certainly not thinking. So maybe that test wasn't a good one for you, then, Kate. And I was like, all over the place before I get where I'm going. Ah, <laughs> right. Okay. I thought that wasn't it, a very good test, I don't think. I thought it might be a, a bit more fun because this stuff can get quite heavy to bring the fictional characters into it. So with um, with the one, you'd have Mr. Spock. Star Trek, Mr. Spock. You know, Claire. logical. Wants everything right. Um, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but Michelle's trying to get in. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Alright, sorry. No, no, that's good. Thank you. I was saying Spock for you, Claire, because I know you like that. Yeah, I love Star Trek. There's yeah. Michelle. I'll let her in. Let's find out. Let's have a look at your ears. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Is Michelle in? She was. She was waiting. Um, where were there? Hang on. I've just. Let's try again. It didn't work. Let's try again. <sighs> well, I just her. Yeah, there she is. Sorry. Yeah, you got her. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Oh, somebody's fire tablet. Hello, fire. <laughs> Hello. I don't know how to change it. Great name, great name. <clears throat> I'll just stay as fire. <laughs> yeah. So we've got um with the one famous ones are Meryl Streep, Gandhi, oh. talk about wanting to get things right, Joan of Arc, <clears throat> yeah, girl power, uh Nelson Mandela, and the rabbit from Winnie the Pooh. So these are the kind of stereo This is what writers often use when they're making a, writing a novel, and film producers use when they're translating a book into a film. They'll bring in another character, an opposing character of a different number type. See, you don't know how widely this stuff is used. This was used in psychometric testing when you went to get that job and you were very, very qualified for it. You didn't get it because you were the wrong personality type. They wouldn't have told you this, but we've been analysed for blooming years in the workplace. They'd want a certain mix of characters in a certain office, or they'd realise that they'd got an imbalance and they don't want that happening again. That's why they sacked the last person. <laughs> and then you wouldn't have known it. You would have done psychometric testing or they would have asked you certain questions in an interview. And you'd think, what's that got to do with the job? Nothing. They were testing out your personality. If this happened, what would you do? I just wondered. So I think it's just good that everybody gets to know this. And as I said to Kate, I'm the best person to teach this because I really didn't want it to be true. I really didn't want to be a number. No, I'm so much more than a number. No, I can't be categorised. And uh, after a long time, I think it was two years, <laughs> I thought, okay, yeah, I suppose I am, yeah, okay, right. Uh, everybody's got to be one, so which one can I be that's the best number? <laughs> <laughs> there 
is no best number. It's the best number, Jenny. No, there's no best number. <laughs> so <clears throat> if we go from highly principled, I hope you can see these extremes. If we are typically a one and we want everything right, then when somebody does something wrong, like if you saw somebody mixing that shouldn't be mixing at the moment, <laughs> then you would be more infuriated than anybody else, that personality type. Whereas a seven would go, oh, well, they're not harming anybody really. You know? Um, so a number one, like Mr. Spock, logical, wants everything right. On a good day. On a bad day, self-righteous, OCD. Those are the neighbours that you think, oh, for goodness sake, couldn't you let it go? Couldn't you let me park just two inches over the line for a day? It's <laughs> Christmas, for goodness sake, you know? No, no, it's got to be right, got to be right, got to be right. The whole world will fall apart if it's not right, you know? But all of these are in balance, you see. So if we went to a number two, we've got altruistic. So I'm trying to just give one word now. Altruistic. Uh, but on the opposite side, manipulative martyr. So number twos are the givers. They're always doing stuff for people. They're really open-hearted on, on the good side. They're fabulous. I had two. Mm, two. Oh, lovely. Mm. When, when it's I, a good I day. I, I couldn't get the manipulated bit because that's really not me. Well, let me explain. And a lot of these, when you that's the first step when you look at that personality type, you think, that's not me. Well, it probably isn't then. So you play with another number. And you play with I did get another one, but I can't remember what the other one came back at, because I did it twice, like, um, yeah. Andre. That's it. Andre. <laughs> God, my name's gone. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. thing. Very well. I can't remember what the other number was I got. I think it might have been a six. I can't remember okay. now. Well, sometimes we go all around the blooming clock face before we know what our number is. But just to, if we can just look at the numbers kind of in isolation so that something will resonate with you and something won't. So the two, wonderful two, Dolly Parton is a two. Mother Teresa, Princess Diana. Now let's go to Princess Diana, shall we? So Princess Diana... A glorious number two. How about that for being altruistic? You know, wanting to save the world and help people. Queen of Hearts. <coughs> Wanted to be the Queen of Hearts, Princess of Hearts. And yet, hell hath no fury like that woman scorned. No, the more a person is a giver and gives from the heart in a kind of innocent way, wants everybody to be okay sacrifices their own comfort to please other people in a good way but as soon as that is um, <coughs> uh, spurned as soon as that is teased as soon as the person that they absolutely love has an affair or does the dirty on them or the boss won't give them the promotion and they know they blooming well deserve it then a little bit of manipulation comes in, a little bit of bitchiness, a little bit of this is a kind of behind the no. scenes thing going on. That's no. Uh, <clears throat> I was so, saying, no, def definitely not. When my husband walked out, I let him go. I didn't do anything at all. I didn't say anything. I've never bad mouthed him in front of my son. To myself, I have. But not, not like really nasty. Just, no, I don't think I've bad-mouthed him. I haven't. Well, I'm so glad that you volunteered, because I can ask you some questions there that will help. <laughs> so. Oh, spotlight is This is fine. called um, being... See, uh, when you, you start thinking... Yeah. And like, when he did leave, um, I, I didn't. I didn't get angry. I didn't get up. I was upset. But I didn't, like, try and manipulate him to stay. That's what he wanted to do. So I let him go. Because if he didn't want to be with me for being me, I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to change. So, and I didn't manipulate him. Well, let's take it out of that context for a minute, and just. And this is what we have to do with ourselves. We have to generalise what happens to us when we're under this duress. So, 
say the situation is heated, could be work or a personal relationship, it could be friends, friendship, the red flag's flying, someone has got to come out on top, it must be somebody's fault, somebody's got their finger right in your face and they're really having a go, right? whoever it might be, how do you react? We all react in one of three ways. The first way is compliance, the second way is withdrawal, and the third way is to assert ourselves. So quite often, not always, but quite often, those knee-jerk reaction people that assert themselves back, they might be the ones that regret things afterwards. So with um, w w what would you say, Fire? <laughs> Out of the three, would you assert, withdraw, or comply? It, it would depend on the situation. If I felt I was being really outdone and and they were in the wrong and I wasn't, I, I would not not be nasty, but I would sort of try and get my point across, and I would say my point, and then I'd be like, right, that's how I feel. I'll go and I'll just talk about it later when you've calmed down and I will, I will just walk. Yeah. I don't tend to get into confrontation. If, the, if they think, and quite often I'll just go something like, oh, that's what you want to believe, that's fine, we'll discuss it later. And I just tend to, to go away. I don't tend to, don't, I, I can't say I, to be fair, I've worked on my own now for so long, I can't really remember. <laughs> Will somebody have a go at fire and we'll see how she reacts? Yeah. <laughs> I think Kate, Kate knows. I think Kate knows me the, the best. I probably was very fiery when I was younger. Yeah, yeah you were more fiery. She's definitely mellowed with age. I oh, was very fiery. It's still... I am, I've, done, I've done a lot of work. <laughs> it's still... Um, there's no wrong or right here, but it's still asserting oneself to say your piece calmly and to say, if that's what you want to think, that's okay. You're asserting your point, you see. And with all of us, as all of, us, all of you are probably thinking, well, how do I react? You've got to think that this is the worst case scenario when you know that person is wrong. That person yeah, is wrong. Yeah, we do it in a, a yeah. calm way, calm. Yeah. And then, but if they were really ranting, I'll just, I'll talk to you later and, and go and go back later when they've calmed down. Okay. So That's probably what I think. If we if we go with the assertion just for a moment then. Do, 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 do. Um compliance. Right, so we've got, we've got three ways, if we were someone who generally, and we look at one situation as you've just been looking at, but then in our quieter moments we'll think and reflect upon lots of other situations, and only then when we kind of generalise, oh usually I assert myself, usually I withdraw, usually I comply, so let's say usually maybe in whatever way we assert ourselves. There are three different ways of asserting ourselves. We can assert, uh, and, and this is how we solve conflict by the way, the conflict within ourselves because they're telling us something that's not right so we're all conflicted. How we assert ourselves to, um, to resolve the conflict within us even if it doesn't affect them. You know? You know, sometimes we don't have to put people right but we need to know what's right ourselves. We need to know, oh, they're having a bad day, or they're completely bonkers, or, well, I don't want to see them again anyway. You know, we need to resolve it ourselves. So the, the assertion of entitlement. Um, so this is about an assertion of will that spills over into the wider world. The focus is on proving one's condition and preserving and furthering the image. Entitlement it's born out of true hope. It dictates what is wanted can ultimately be possessed and that events will turn out for the best for them. So conflict comes as a shock to challenge this perception. I mean, in a custody battle, 
that's my child. You know, that's my child. I'm entitled to that child. That's my child. So I'm going to assert my rights over that child, you know, for the for really good intentions. It's not like um, they will agree, with, they'll comply. They will assert themselves because of a sense of entitlement. You can assert yourself, secondly, by an overriding and overwhelming desire. This assertion is born of desire, fancy, an entitlement of experience to elevate one's enjoyment of life. Well, I'm going to do that because I'm, I'm going to jump out of that aeroplane because I bloody well want to feel what it feels like before I die. That's on my bucket list. So I've got this absolute fervent desire to do this. So uh, the third one is assertion of strength. I've got to get them before they get me. I might not even hold to what's right, but I know they're out to get me, so I'd better get them first. I, want, I need to prove that I'm stronger. So with every um, category, whether it's compliance or withdrawal or assertion, there are three categories within that. Does anybody think they're a compliant sort of a person? Not me. Okay. I used to be not anymore. <laughs> no. no. I used to be actually. I used to be very compliant. Mm. This is the interesting yeah. thing because, you know, as, as we talk as um, from our own personality, put how we've evolved and we, we deal with things differently now. The interesting thing about the Enneagram, these things don't change. We might do it in a different way, but if we're compliant, we're always compliant, no matter what. And we might like to think that we're different and we might call it by other names. But for example, um, the safe compliance is we comply by ingratiating ourselves with somebody else. And um, let's say we do something at work we don't want to do because of our wages or because we don't upset somebody or we want to keep safe. We're going to agree to this even though we don't internally agree. On the outside we're going to agree because it's keeping us safe or it's keeping somebody else safe. It's not particularly what we want to do, but we're going to comply. Whereas somebody else at work would be saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? Do, 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 do. I'm going to go to the boss and get this sorted out. So a compliant person, this is usually a six, compliant person needs at all costs to, to be safe. They're the ones that go home and their husband or their wife says, well, what the hell did you agree to that for? What did you do? You don't realise, I could have lost my job. I've got to do this. You've got to keep your head down. Just keep your head down. It doesn't matter what we really think. We know what we really think, but we're not going to let them know. We've got to comply to be safe. And another one might comply for a completely different reason. To be helpful. Even if you don't think it's the right thing to do, or you'll be greatly inconvenienced, um, I thought you were going to the bank today. Oh, well, um, uh, so-and-so needed a lift. Well, why did you give them a lift? I mean, these things, this is why I bring spouses and partners into it, that they know you better than you know yourself quite often. So you might think, oh, I'm an assertive sort of a person. Then why did you agree to give so-and-so a lift? Well, they needed a lift. But I thought you were going to the bank. Well, I'm going to the bank tomorrow. So you've complied. You put their needs before your own. These are the twos. These are the twos that give up their own needs to help somebody else. And whilst we might all think that we like that, we are to a degree, but the two does that a lot. And it irritates family and friends. Not because they're um, doing anything that harms anybody else but because they'll put their their own needs to the bottom but they will also then perhaps regret it or at least feel a bit irked when they've given up their day to do something for somebody else and when it's not appreciated this is where martyrdom comes into the two if they don't feel appreciated 
Ooh. They may not tell you till 10 years later, but they certainly um, won't be very happy. But they'll continue to do things where somebody else would, um, would do it a different way. Somebody could comply um, because they're doing the right thing. They might not want to go to the authorities about the neighbours who are having a party over Christmas with 20 people in there. They, they might really love the neighbours and they really don't want to cause any trouble, but they've got to do the right thing. So they comply to the rightness of the matter. You see? It has to be done. Yeah, but Sansa's getting into trouble. It has to, it's the right thing to do. You know it's the right thing to do. So these drive their um, partners mad by doing the right thing, even when they're going to suffer the consequences for doing that right thing. They're complying to what's right. <coughs> yeah. So this is what I mean by like it's a job so complicated. Hmm? Is that Like a job's work. <laughs> Are you coming on screen today, hon? Yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Hi, Lucy. Hello, yeah. <laughs> anyway, carry on, Jenny. <laughs> Enough about me. Well, let's talk, oh, let's talk about fear then. That's a good one. Uh, by the way, with those um, compliances, assertions, and withdrawing, that will point you into one of three numbers. So if you said to me, oh, I, I usually comply, and that's because I've got to do the right thing, that would directly point you into the direction of a number one. If you said, oh, I usually, com I usually do things for other people, but, you know, it's because they really need it, and I can always go to the bank tomorrow, then we'd point you in the direction of a two. But if you said, oh, I've got to be right by all costs and they've got to know about it and if anybody tells me what to do or my kids then they're in for it then you're probably an eight but these are very very loose uh, like a funnel it's a typing tunnel if you like you start to go down this this and this but certainly the certain numbers that are withdrawing sort of a number certain ones that are complying sort of a numbers and certain ones that are assertive Assert, always has to assert themselves sort of a number but the good one also is fear what is your greatest fear I wonder so this is a uh, chapter 10 just scooting because it's good it's nice this the whole idea of fear if we can overcome our fears if we know and this is what the Enneagram is to me once we know that this is our number type's typical fear, that in the future when we feel that fear, I might think, oh, it's because I'm a nine, oh, of course. Not everybody's gonna feel that fear in that particular way. Oh, it's because I'm... So it gives you that objectivity. So, a fear, has anybody got an overriding fear of themselves being perceived as evil or corrupt. You just want to make sure that you're never going to be as bad as your father or as a terrible yeah. person. Who's that? Who's that? Me. Me, Shell. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, we all are to some degree, you know, aren't we? But this, this really disturbs this number type person. The fear of being corrupt or evil. They've got a profound sense of integrity, constantly moving away from corruption or things that uh, would make them seem a nasty sort of a person, um, being bad, they want to be virtuous. It gets reflected into the world as having a keen eye for wrongdoings and um, the whole world at large and it enrages them when somebody um, really doesn't do the right thing and um, does anybody have a fear that would be a number one by the way um, a fear of being unloved or unwanted by others a deep-rooted fear um, we've all got these fears to a degree but this would be an overriding fear 
Whereas it, when you're with a group of people, they'd say, oh yeah, I don't want to be on my own either. But some people are absolutely traumatised by the idea, I could die during this pandemic and I'll die alone. Oh my God. And that would be a real powerful fear for them. Where somebody else would say, yeah, I don't want to be alone either. <laughs> but they're not really feeling that visceral fear, you know. Did any of you have that fear of being alone, unwanted? No, fear of being left, but left. not. And if, um, if somebody did leave, would that lead to a fear, the next fear is of being worthless? Or they left me because, I don't want them to leave because I want to feel my sense of worth. I want to feel valuable in the world. I want to be appreciated for what I offer. Yeah, I can relate to that one. Yeah, yeah me. I thought the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You too. Yeah, that's a popular one. <laughs> give, give that th put that as a three in brackets for yourselves then. There's so many of these aspects, and it's those of you who've done the test. It's when you get the greatest number in one particular category that it leads you to the actual number type that you are. So you might have lots of um, different elements, but the overriding, the, the number of ones that you have in a certain category would determine your type. And I say it's much easier to, to type somebody else than yourself. So the next fear is of not being special. These are the artists. These are people that create in whatever way. They want to put their unique stamp on the world. They want to be, do they want to be known for having contributed, having done something quite significant? And even if that's at Christmas time, the person that wraps the best present. You know, oh, it's such, so good at wrapping. Oh, 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 oh. That was or, Nadia then. Yeah? <laughs> Nadia was like... <laughs> It's me. Artistic. So, well, the um, if we jump straight to, because I'm aware of the time, if we jump straight to the number fours, which are the creatives, creative, passionate, artistic, wonderful, the creators of beauty in the world, reproducing things, making things better, more beautiful and artistic, on the one hand, I told you they all have a bad side, they all have a polar opposite. Melancholic self-contempt. The tortured artist. Nothing's ever good enough because they've got to keep creating, making it better, making it better. Michael Jackson, Johnny Depp, Eeyore from <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Steve Jobs, Van Gogh. So once you, st I think kind of it's easier to give out these personalities that you know about, either from fiction or whatever, so that you can kind of think, oh, I can kind of grasp that personality type because um, I know the character of the celebrity, like Michael Jackson. You know, talk about creative, eh? But um, there is always a, another side to us too. There's another fear. A fear of being useless or incapable. These are the doers. These are people that got to get things done, got to get things done, got to get things done. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a yeah. doer. Yeah. Yeah. So with this one, um, it's a, uh, a very positive aspect to all of the numbers. But to make it interesting, I'll tell you some of the negative things. <laughs> it's based upon... It's based upon... Well, all of these are based upon a fear. So the two does things for people are very, very helpful because they don't want to be alone. The one um, makes everything right because it thinks if everybody's right, it's going to be a brilliant world. And if we all do, if we find the right way of doing it, we're all going to be okay. And um, the... Four wants to create and create and create something better and beautiful and wonderful, but there's there's a downside to if I haven't done it, if I don't create, if if people don't like it, then they start to 
fall into self-contempt. But the fear of being useless or incapable, it's a pervasive underlying fear of being useless, overwhelmed and incapable of dealing with the world because the world's a scary place. And having this expertise will be a good defence against those dangers. dangers. They strive to become knowledgeable and competent, as knowledgeable and competent as possible in all the things they do, from balancing the books to washing their car or making a pizza. Knowledge and expertise is vitally important. Therefore, they must not only learn as much as they can about something, they must become its master so they can reassure themselves and those they love that they are competent and capable. They are constantly aiming to move away from ignorance and towards knowledge and understanding. So under every single, you see how it's based on the sins if you like, underlying every human drive is a fear that we're moving away from and sometimes in moving away from it, if, if for example, God forbid, but if for example this uh, pandemic wasn't solvable, the fives would be really tortured because they say, there must be a way, there must be a way. And they, that's what makes them the visionary because they will find a way when everybody else says there isn't. They'll invent a way. They'll take all the information and they'll do what nobody else has been able to do because of their competency, because of their knowledge. Or it could be a three. A three thinks, a, a three is very ambitious. They're the ambitious ones. Oprah Winfrey, Tony Robbins, Jimmy Carter, Alexander the Great, and the gopher, the beaver in <laughs> um, Winnie the Pooh. So the three goes from really, really ambitious and productive to vindictive. Why is somebody else more successful than me when I work harder or I'm better looking or and they're the ones on show all the time So I hope you can see that there there's always a balance to be had the pendulum will swing both ways and we're usually somewhere in the middle mm. the um, so We've talked about the, the five obsessive recluse the hoarders and um, the six Hard-working stability. Most people in the world, the, the biggest um, number of people, number type, is six. They are, um, they personify hard-working stability. And on the other end of the scale, paranoid persecution. They have to strive for safety. They're, they're the safe ones. You got Woody Allen, Richard Nixon. Prince Harry, Tom Hanks, Frodo Baggins, Millhouse from The Simpsons, and Piglet. So I'm just rushing to give you an overview of the different characters. And if you think later on, oh yeah, I think I'm more like Piglet, I start to think, I'm going to look into that number and see how it might help. The significance of knowing your number means that when you when you're a bit depressed when you're down and, and when you're f uh, finding yourself thinking certain thoughts and being certain ways you once you know how you would likely be um, adversely affected then you can pull yourself out quicker you can kind of get that objectivity and I'll explain what I mean in a sec sevens who are the joyous ones? Who are the ones that just love life? Who are the ones that are really enthusiastic and they're always positive and cheering everybody else up? Where's the sevens? I can be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, Shaleen is a seven. Yeah? <laughs> sevens are lovely. The sevens are um, completely joyous. Everything's a game. They really want to experience things and they want other people to have the best of life as well. They want to enjoy things to the utmost degree. On the opposite side, it's materialistic excess. <laughs> you got to pray they never have loads of money, because they're just, they're just, they're just, um, yeah, they're the lottery winners who um, 
lose it all within a couple of years. Um, and this, again, it's balance. It's not saying you're going to be like that. If you keep positive, you'll always be the joyous one. But what to watch out for is materialistic excess. So we've got Robin Williams, one of my favourite people in the world. Dick Van Dyke, Mozart, John F. Kennedy, Miss Piggy, <laughs> <laughs> and Tigger. Tigger's a wonderful thing. Tigger, Tigger, Tigger. Sometimes their joy can be quite irritating to somebody who's in a bad mood. <laughs> and the, well, you're always looking on the bright side. This is a really bad situation we're in. Yeah, but do 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 do. Yeah, always cheering people up. Which is great until it's kind of to their detriment. If they're not feeling it on the inside, but they're still trying to be happy-go-lucky and cheer everybody else up, then um, it's a bit of a uh, downer for them internally because it becomes a struggle. When it's their natural exuberance and everything is going right, then they're just the best people to be with. Now, the, the eights. Denzel Washington, Queen Latifah, Frank Sinatra, Muhammad Ali, Darth Vader, and the Heffalump. <laughs> From Winnie the Pooh. These are, um, <laughs> they are magnanimous. They are just wonderful. They fill a room. They're full of energy, and they they'll save the world. They're looking for the innocent. They want to support the weak. They are absolutely fabulous. So I'm hoping you see there's just wonderful aspects to every single number. On the downside, they are vengeful. They're going to get you back. They're going to make sure that they win the election at all costs. They're going to make sure that nobody else, or particularly somebody that they think is doing bad in the world, they're going to be strong up. You know, I'm going to make sure that doesn't uh, bring the world into downfall. So they're, this, they're looking for the innocents and they'll find the innocent and support them. And But God forbid you're suddenly not innocent anymore because they turn to, to vengeance. If they find out you've betrayed them or that you're not as good as you made yourself out to be or they thought you were, oh. And then we've got the nine, this is the last one, and then we can do the fun stuff. So the nine is uh, Whoopi Goldberg, the Queen, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, and actually Winnie the Pooh himself. They're referred to as the peacemaker. They go from optimistic unity, want everybody to be okay. Everybody okay? Please? And, and the opposite side of that is dissociated non-function so they're the overeaters the um, the sin that's associated with the nines and this is what it's born of this is what the nine um, the sin produces the nine is <coughs> sloth and it's sloth in the terms of not looking after oneself putting everybody else first but different to the two the two does it to kind of ingratiate themselves and they want to be somehow recognised, be thought of as a good person. The nine just has to do it to make everybody get on. And if anybody is out of sorts within a group, the nine is traumatised, wants everybody to, everybody to get on, which is kind of impossible in many situations. So that's when they kind of, a nine is a withdrawing character. So they kind of think, oh, oh, I don't like this, I can't cope with this. And they'll go um, all introvert. So that's all of them. And the, the fun thing is, guys, that once you know your number, then you know, for example, I am a nine. And when I'm at my best, optimistic unity. When I'm at my worst, dissociated non-function and what I gravitate to for my spiritual growth and this is very interesting to me with everybody that I've talked to who knows their number they often don't like their spiritual growth path 
My spiritual growth path, the number, is three. So nines become three when they're in growth. Three, the best of three. So when you're in growth, you go to the best of the number you're gravitating to. So the best of the three is ambitious. If I'm in a really bad way, I will descend, so you either ascend or descend. I ascend to the three and I descend to the six, to safety. So yes, everybody wants to be safe, but if people that know me, and particularly someone like Paula that knows my number type, if they notice me descending into safety, wanting to do things to keep myself and everybody safe, then I'm descending to the worst of the six. I'm going to paranoid persecution rather than hard-working stability. So a nine descends to the worst of the six, paranoid persecution. So if I'm feeling paranoid or if I'm overdoing the safety bit, oh, I'm in descent. If I'm feeling ambitious, yeah, I'll do a Zoom talk. That'd be nice. I don't mind being on camera. I'm going to the best of me, the best of the three, which is ambitious. So um, who knows who th gets an idea of what number type they might be? And I'll tell you how you descend and how you ascend. I seem to have a bit of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, are you a compliant or an asserter or withdrawal? Do you tend to withdraw? All three of them are different. <laughs> I'm like different. Mm. I, I don't know actually withdraw. The only time I can associate to the nine, so I do like things to be peaceful and positive, um, but I do get sometimes, um, like when we go on holiday, there's so much socialising and, and being the peacemaker is really wearing, so then I do need to withdraw to kind of almost charge my battery back up. Um, so probably some of the nine as well, but yeah, I can see other bits as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's it, you see, and this is the, the right way, in my opinion, of doing this personality testing. If you want to know what number you are, get to know what the numbers are, you know, get the book, get to know and talk to each other and then recognize that how you appear to others isn't always as you are and it's it's a weird thing and that's why like I say we're so much better at working on other people you'll be typing your husbands and your children before you know it think, oh it's they're a fool they're the whole oh, okay and you kind of start to make more allowance for their bad mood because when we're with somebody in whatever number type and they're in a good mood and they're in a good place, like Shalina, when she's doing her joyful seven stuff, it's like, yeah, because she's shining a light and we're all basking in that light and that energy and we're all lifted. But when um, she's going into materialistic excess, if ever, it's like, and now I think you've had enough to drink. Um, and no, I don't. I don't. I don't want another cake. Honestly, I don't. Just, just leave it. For goodness' sake, you know. <laughs> um, so all of the positives of all of the numbers. If I just um, recap on the positive side, ones are highly principled and everything done right. Great. This serves society so well. Every single number in a good mood, in an elevated state, does wonders. So they go from highly principled to their ascension, which is the seven, joyous. So ones, when they're highly principled and in a good mood, they become joyous. And twos, they're altruistic. And when they're in a really good place, a good mood, they ascend to the four. They become really creative in that altruistic way. They, they're able to help the world in ways that haven't ever been thought of before. The threes, when uh, they're ambitious, they're in a good mood, everything's going well, they're, they're really prosperous, they'd like to share with everybody else because they're doing so really, really well. And then when they're in ascending, when they're on their ascension, they go to six. The best of the six, which is hardworking stability. They're doing really well, they're going to continue to work hard and do well and prosper. Everybody's going to benefit. 
the four, when they're in a good place, they've been really creative. They're, they're creating beauty in the world and they're reinterpreting stuff that's already gone before but bringing their two pennies into it. And when they're in a really good place, when they're ascending, they go to one, which is being highly principled and doing the right thing with their art, with their way. But we all know about the tortured artist who perhaps produces things that people don't quite like, but it's art, so we need to appreciate it. And da, da, da. So the four is wonderfully creative, turns, to, turns into the highly principled one. The five, the visionary, producing wonderful things, collecting all the information, adding their own intellect into it, wonderful. They ascend to the eight, being magnanimous, helping the world ascend. They, they're wonderful, fabulous, incredible people. The sixes, with their hard-working stability, they ascend to the nine, to optimistic unity, wanting everybody to get on. And it's wonderful that we can all be hard-working and stable and benefit and be optimistic about the future. And the sevens, the sevens are joyous anyway, at the best of them, and they ascend to the five, being visionaries, joyous visionaries, people that create and invent in a joyous way with their intellect and their inventiveness. And the eights, they're magnanimous in their um, positive state and they ascend to two, being altruistic. So that they're the best of the eight means that they then share it with the world and they become altruistic and do all good things that way. And the nine, when they're in their best place, optimistic unity, everybody, want everybody to be all together, all collective, doing brilliant things and feeling happy, optimistic, the future's great. Um, and when they ascend, they go to the ambitious sides, they, they don't mind putting themselves out there and helping everybody else as well and being them um, ambitious and productive in the world. So all of the, all of the numbers are absolutely brilliant but we all have our place and once we know that we often don't know our ascension. It's much easier when you read the book to re recognise perhaps in the quiet of your own space oh god that's me that's what happens when I when I descend but when you look like I did um, at the growth that's often the last thing that you want because we're all meant to move out of our comfort zones once we've become the best we can within that uh, confines of that number then we elevate to the best parts of the next number but, and, and this is arguable by all the experts in the field, we never change our number. We become the best of it and we aim to be the best of this other number. And there is no ascension in terms of numbers. It's not like the nine's the best because it's at the top or anything. It's, it's not like um, uh, the four's down here so that's not particularly good they're all equal you know like the Knights of the Round Table which is also part of the Enneagram and um, all of these um, folk tales fables even biblical stories have characters in them for balance and so there is no good there is no bad there is just understanding of the personality type that we are and the recognition that if we if we're finding ourselves in a dark place, this is the way to pull ourselves out because we can get that objectivity and think, oh, when I just want to not talk to anybody and not do very much and become a bit dissociated, that's actually a really bad thing for me. Even though I want to do that sometimes, it's like, no, you've got to get out there, Jen. You've got to get out there. You've got to talk to people. You've got to say, no, but I don't really want to. Them. Yeah, come on, come on. Paula would say, come on, let's do this. Do, 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 do. And Paula, for example, as a, a brilliant five, when she is too much into the information, we've got to really get all this information together. And it's, yeah, that's not going to solve this, Paula. 
Well, yes, it will. Yes, it will. We'll just work it on the phone, this person, and do that. And uh, mm. Sometimes the intellect isn't just going to solve it, you know. And um, I think once we recognise, and personally recognise, which is usually by somebody that we're close to who knows our number two, then they know, oh, when Jenny does this, oh, you've just been too safe. That's a six. You, the worst of the six. Paranoid persecution, they're not out to get you, Jen. No, just because they didn't buy your book. That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so when you start to recognise that side of your own character, you think, oh, yeah, okay. This is what this number nine does in this circumstance. Oh, and I've done that sometimes. Oh, that's descending. So what's ascending? Really? I should do that? Oh, but when it goes really well, you feel really good, don't you, Jen? Oh, okay. Okay, so that's my ascension. Right, okay. Mm. And so, once you get an inkling about what sort of number that you are, and it's usually based on what you're trying to avoid, what you're trying to um, stop happening. Like I say, the two wants to help everybody because they want to be loved. Why else would you want to help everybody? Um, the threes are really ambitious and they've got to work really hard and get lots of money and keep everybody safe and themselves and so they're really ambitious because they think that they've just got it they've just got that driving force they've got a fear of being worthless so they try to create worth for themselves because inside they feel worthless the four feels that there's something wrong there's always something wrong with the four that's why they are the artists, that's why they create, because there's something not quite right with that. I could do that better, I feel this creative spot, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do because they feel there's always something wrong. And the five, they think they can solve the world with information and with the intellect. And so they're striving to do that because there's a, there's a fear that they just didn't know enough. And this is what links to the childhood wound. At some point in the five's development as a child, they didn't know enough. They were shocked by something that happened. And unconsciously they thought, if only I'd known. I could have stopped my parents getting divorced. I could have stopped my mother dying. As a child they thought this. As an adult they know that's not the case, but as a child in that red hot moment, they made this vow, if I know enough for the rest of my life, I'll be okay. I'll be safe. So it's all based on the childhood wound and how we spend the rest of our lives trying to fulfill that. The uh, six thinks that that hard working stability, if I just keep my head down, I keep working and I keep myself safe and I do all this, then, then I'll be all right. And that's what descends into that persecution and being a bit paranoid um, if they're not in a good place. They always think that um, if they if they just work hard, if they just try harder, and if they just keep their head down, they'll be okay. Because maybe the childhood wound was they weren't okay. Something happened, and they they forever need to be safe, keep themselves safe in that way. And and it goes on, you know, the the, the childhood wounds and the fears and the poisons and the prisons and the. Um, excesses and the virtue the virtues a, a really good one to end on actually what do you value above all else in the world go on then um, Kate what what do you think your virtue is what do you want to be what do you want people to regard you as I think my most important value first and foremost is my children um, but after that, it's just, and it's going to sound so like Miss World or something, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and when people, it is that kind of just, yeah, for people to be the best they can be and the happiest they can be um, in the world and feel the safest and most comfortable in their skin, but also to shine their light. So what do you want to be regarded as personally by those people? By, by the world at large? I suppose just someone who helps, just someone to bounce off, 
Oh, I just fell off then. As a helper. Yeah. It's probably a much better word than that, but... Anybody else want to volunteer? Dog crazy. <laughs> Don't care. Just dog crazy. <laughs> Anyone? I'm similar than Kate. That's Kate. Uh, we, we are just so similar. I just can't believe that. Like, whatever you say, I'm like, oh, I have the same. I have the same. And then I say something and you say, like, oh, I'm the same. We're just so similar. It's beyond. And I'm the same. So, like, doing your 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 deeds, like, doing something good and, and making this shit place being a little bit better and helping people to find a way and through your pain, kind of put a meaning to what you've been through and allowing people to maybe have easier journey, if that makes sense. Um, uh, uh, yeah. All wonderful stuff, all great stuff. So I'm going to leave you with this last thing. There, there's so many, like I say, the fears, the traps, the poisons, prisons, the childhood wound, that will all point to a particular number. So please, if you have taken an online test, Oh, there's so many more aspects to this but this one which one I'm going to read nine paragraphs and I want everybody to think which one most resonates with them so number one would say I am a perfectionist perfection strives to meet perceived standards of right and wrong in order to be acceptable. I want to be as much as possible. I want myself and the rest of the world to be perfect. I've got this idea of what a, a godlike situation would be with the world. I want the world to be perfect. I want to be perfect. I know we can't all be perfect all of the time, but I'm going to do my damnedest. I want the right things to be done. And so I'm a perfectionist. Oh, okay. Mm -mm. I don't, get, I don't care what everybody gets. I am striving perf for perfection. Number twos would say, um, I love freedom. You might think this is a bit strange. But I love freedom. Freedom from personal needs allows me to focus on the needs of others in order to feel needed and liked in the world. Number three. Well, I'm not going to give numbers anymore because I'm mixing them up. I am, this is the third thing that I'm saying rather than this is a number and I realise it might be confusing. I am efficient. Efficiency produces results and achieves goals that proves one's worth. I am efficient. I am authentic. Authenticity is derived from being true to an inner emotional reality that distinguishes oneself from others. I am authentic. The one and only. I am a king. The one and only. I am a keen observer. Observing the world by pulling back from it in order to gain a more objective understanding of it. I'll get all the information and I'll come back to you. I'm a keen observer. I know what's going on. I know what's going on. I've researched it all. Observing the world by pulling back from it in order to gain a more objective understanding of it. I like my security this is the next one security seeks certainty in a future full of negative possibilities requiring a cautious or reactive response to perceived threats i like my security next one i am an idealist Idealism reframes reality by paying attention to what's positive or interesting whilst avoiding what's negative 
or problematic. I'm an idealist. I, next one, I want justice. <coughs> justice exposes hidden truths and redresses the balance by confronting and asserting oneself against others. I want justice. There must be justice in the world. Next one. I am a seeker. I'm seeking to understand from the viewpoint of others, to merge and become one in order to be part of something greater than oneself. I am a seeker. Okay, have you got your um, answers? Who's a perfectionist? Oh, the right to be. Ah. <laughs> the right to be. Mm -hmm. Who loves freedom? Freedom from their personal needs, <laughs> focusing on everybody else. <laughs> My little mirror there. <laughs> Who is efficient? Wants to produce results and achieve goals that prove their worth. They're good enough. Need to prove that they're good enough. These are the people the with yeah. the childhood wounds who were never good enough. I've Their parents never thought they were good yeah, enough. I've got, I've got a bit of that too. Mm. Yeah, I mean. I am authentic. Who's authenticity? Yeah, that would be me. Is that me or unique? Was that, was that one? Yeah, yeah. No, you're yeah. all that yeah. lit. Yeah. 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 yeah, that'd yeah. be me. Yeah. Completely different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does unique mean special? As in hair clip special? Special. <laughs> <laughs> I've got loads of special dogs. <laughs> <laughs> if it means that kind of special, then yeah, it's me. <laughs> What's hair clip special, Michelle? Oh, no, don't make me sound ill. I might offend someone. <laughs> you can message me. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to show you a picture. Now, you know, like in the, in the oh, 70s when special types of girls. Hang on, let me balance the phone. Special types of girls had oh, had hair clips in like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that kind of special. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's only anyone. <laughs> Anybody the keen observer, observing the world, pulling back from it in order to have a more objective understanding. I can be. Mm. I'm going to say, I observe the dogs in my daily life so I can help them better. And then you need to find in lots of different instances where where it applies, not just in the one instance. And, and no, it's the only instance I'll do that in. I don't observe anything else. Andre, I do. Andre I, probably I, you could very likely be a five if you've answered to that one as well about the keen observer because you've got a few points now in the five direction, by the way, from what you've already said. And this is great, I mean, if we had a whole day or a couple of days, as we go on, somebody that knows it back to front, which you, you need to in order to type people, will pick up in the first few moments, macabrely, um, what each person's number is, and then we'll spend the rest of the time kind of uh, digging a little bit and putting you in scenarios, and then finally could say without any question whatsoever, ah, yes, you're a five. And then that will absolutely help you for the rest of your life, believe me, because it, it, it helps you get along with others, because you recognize when you're out of sorts and you're going to interact with others, and they have this kind of, when any, as, as you all know, when you're interacting with somebody and you're not in a good place, they'll pick up on it intuitively anyway and then you'll spark something off in them and then it all ends up badly and then somebody's <laughs> got to apologise and, and so you can kind of pre prevent all of that happening thing oh uh, I'm just going to say this to you but I'm feeling so and so at the moment and I know it's not your fault but I just need to say it da, da, da. Oh, okay so you kind of recognise your own out of sortness before you interact or even after you've interacted and thinking, oh, actually, that was very six of me, and um, I don't want to be that, and it's only because I was feeling this. Yeah. So this is um, 
such a, a, a wonderful gift to give yourselves. Uh, like mm. I said, I've, I've really simplified it in the uh, the next book, the Enne the Enneagram Soul Types, and it's just something I think everybody ought to play with. I mean, we do enough quizzes, don't we? Um, from the back of magazines when we were teenagers to now Facebook giving us little quiz quizzes. Um, are you a lion or are you <laughs> are you are you this are you that? Um, and so all of those are kind of based very loosely on these different personality types. So you might as well go to the original source, which was in AD 375, you know, um, and find. Uh, I mean. After this Greek philosopher uh, got all the information together and Pope Gregory stole it and all that, uh, Gurdjieff in 1870 created a mystery school called the Fourth Way. There was still no personality typings in it, but believe me, all of this stuff has been known mostly to the male community, mostly to Kabbalists and mostly to the Freemasons. And that's why it came into the workplace, because they wanted to find out surreptitiously how you'd perform at work, how far they could push you, who you might have clashes with, etc. And it's just, I was told, uh, this is channeled information, my stuff. I was told a long time ago um, that it was uh, the real um, information was of the oral tradition it was only passed down it was, it was so sensitive and so important it was only passed down uh, through one person telling another who was trusted but it's come to the stage now and I was told a couple of years ago while I write the book um, it's important that everybody who's interested knows this stuff for themselves because it's it's the way that people can get along with each other even when we're in that place where we don't think we like them. When Can we... I just say something? Yeah, go on. I had like an emergency session with Jenny like a couple weeks ago because uh, I was like in my relationship. It was just so bad. I just felt like I'm not having this, I have enough. And I had an emergency session with Jenny and I said like, can you explain me what's going on? Because it, I felt like we're two different people having you to yeah, kind of we want to make it work but for some reason it doesn't work like he's on a mars i'm literally on a venus we perceive the world differently we have a uh, different way of expressing emotion different way of communication uh i want to talk he withdraw he, he and it's just a mess so after an hour with jenny i was like oh my god i know what's happening oh my god God, okay, what to do with him? And she said, oh, that's the way to do it. And I've been working on that journey and it's getting better. It's getting much better. And it's because I'm very emotional and very spiritual and I sense emotion. Uh, he's on a country um, and uh, and it's just, we find it's just so difficult to communicate and solve any problems and get along to kind of together on an emotional and common communication level. Uh, but we want to make it work. It was really weird. Uh, but because he's the type that he doesn't talk, I mean, he doesn't do a therapy, he doesn't talk about emotions, it was very hard and thank God, Jenny, you're in my life because it really shifted everything, like my understanding of his way of communicating and expressing things kind of made a massive shift to our relationship, so uh, we are spending Christmas together. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much and I can't stress like I know it's kind of reading about uh, numbers and things like that but when I started talk to Jenny about what's the problem and how we approach it and her explanation was just a massive shift breaker and it was just really like oh my god it was a lifesaver uh, so thank you for that because it's really shifted everything in our in my home thank you Thank you. I mean, it's um, it's so important. I've been rushing as um, 
as Paul would understand, rushing through the information to give you as much as I possibly can, to give you this overview and to tell you how important it is. Though, when you see me directly, one-to-one, -one, and you give me a scenario that between yourself and another person, straight away, get, it's an intuitive thing, think, oh, they're probably an eight, oh, I think they're a five, oh, and you're a three, so of course they're going to have these clashes, you know. But the yeah. wonderful thing is, and as I said to Gosha, imagine you're with somebody, whether it's friend or lover or child, or uh, whatever, mother, you know, you're with somebody and they're irritating the heck out of you, you know, this is how you oh, know yes. about them, oh, it's like, oh, your hackles are rising, mm, and you're at that point where you're going to, mm, you've had enough, you know? that is because people, that is because we don't understand them, and the most thing that we want is to be understood too. And so you don't feel understood, they don't feel understood, communication's broken down, it's World War Three. <laughs> you know? And, you know, um, this is, uh, I know uh, you guys are going to understand me when I say this, which I wouldn't say in other scenarios, and only because this is private, but it was said to me ten years ago we were headed towards World War Three. Unless we could find another way of communicating with each other and bringing the soul back together because we're all fragments of the same soul and as we are fragments we are one of nine types and if we can be at least with just one other person and see the world through their eyes putting our own personality aside for a moment seeing it from their point of view then we're actually kind of living two lives we, we don't need to if you believe in linear time which I don't if you were thinking of that model, you don't have to reincarnate as another personality type to learn other lessons, etc. You can learn, Gosha can learn from her husband's perspective. He can learn from her perspective and think, oh, I understand that because you are this way inclined, you're seeing the world that way, and oh, right, okay. And so, oh, yeah, hmm, this is about not over un understanding just ourselves, understanding the person that we love most in the world and can't get on with or hate most in the world and need to find some common ground because we work with them or we're in a political situation that we need to they need to lead the country etc. Now the, the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment I'm told by some spiritual leaders, I'm told that if we get together and understand each other and find other ways of communicating rather than taking our clothes off and mixing bodily fluids uh, if we can find this other way of communicating having to separate ourselves physically and develop more of an understanding in these sort of ways then we've, how much better is that than having to have a world war it's all about bringing the soul back together and so this is kind of a, a lesser um, torment, a, letter, a lesser hit on society rather than some sort of um, physical conflict where everybody kind of groups together. Um, if your group, for example, you've got um, different personalities, I, I, obviously can see all that which is wonderful and you will work together and can irritate each other but you know you, you love each other as well and it's all great and it, let's say that you one of you fell out with the other but then you found that they were being persecuted by somebody else suddenly you all gang together and support each other and that's why World War Three was proposed because they wanted to see we we're all getting along again. We would group together. If aliens invaded, all of a sudden, you know, China and America would be thick thieves again. You know, let's save the planet. And so this idea of us communicating and understanding each other and our foibles and being able to put our ego to one side, because it's the negative part of the ego that descends. Well, that's when the negative ego comes out, which is not your friend, and will do things to um, save itself. The negative ego is a, quite a trickster. If we can rise above our own ego and see everything from somebody else's point of view, 
and as another point of view, then we we are um, at that point of unity. And so uh, it, it is just really important stuff, folks. This is with your book, Jenny. Is it um, quite straightforward to read? Is it written for kind of other academics, or can anybody kind of access it? Anybody can access it. In fact, this this first one. I've done at the beginning an adventure, like an adventure book. So I've put you in a situation and depending on would you do this or would you do that, depending on your answer you go to a certain part of the book. So that would tell you, put you down what I call a typing tunnel. That would put you into, um, well you couldn't possibly be a seven, you could be one of these three numbers. And um, let's say um, one of them is um, you're on a spaceship, for example, and the oxygen's about to cut out and you're at the control panel, you don't know what you're doing and you can see a few people have already passed out. What do you do? Do you go to save them? Do you go to see if you could do something for them? Or do you figure it all out on the uh, um, control panel, even though you don't know what you're doing? Or do you sound an alarm to get somebody else? You see, the ones that will figure it out on the control panel, they're usually the fives. If I get the information right, I can save everybody. The ones that fly to the first person who's passed out, they're usually the twos. I'll give you my oxygen, because I need you to survive. You know? So there's, there's little um, insights in the story. It's a story, and then depending on what you would do in that circumstance, you would go to this other part of the book. Mm. which I thought was a brilliant way of doing it but it does have um, the uh, the adventure the Enneagram adventure um, as well as the typing tunnel you know what's your childhood wound what do you most want to avoid in life what's your pleasure what do you gravitate towards um, and it's the fears that and your sin as we've just been talking about here so it has both, you see, which is why it was kind of complicated. Jenny, would you put a link to that book on on a on a page? Yeah, <laughs> send me the link. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I could share it for you. Is it on Amazon as well? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Sure. So, would you recommend? Which one would you recommend? You've obviously written a second one on the same subject. Yeah. Which one yeah. would you? Well, I'd say go for the new one, which is the Enneagram Soul Types and if you love that then you'll, you'll absolutely love this because it's got the adventure in it as well but if you wanted more of a comprehensive text if you want the adventure as well as the typing tunnel as I call it then you'd want that one okay. so there's, there's the choice really yeah, if you can send me the links and then I'll share them up for you Jenny okay mm -hmm. yeah and then Thank you, that was really interesting. I'm um, sure, still not sure what number I am, but I've <laughs> narrowed it down a bit. <laughs> I'm really glad when people aren't sure. It's yeah. worse when somebody says, I'm a three, I'm a three, and you absolutely know they're not, and you think, oh, <laughs> they're going to spend the next ten years thinking they're a three, and it's not going to serve them at all knowing that, you know. I mean, straight away, I, I would put certain people of certain types already, but then I would need to ask you certain questions and then speak. I mean, it's great when you've got a group, particularly people that know each other, because I could go to another person and say, do you think this? Oh, no, actually. No. But it, yeah. it's uh, a lot of people that do this will vow never to tell you your number. Because just like hypnotherapy, once you make a decision for yourself, based on the choices available at an unconscious level, there's no stopping you. Once somebody has decided they're not going to smoke at an unconscious level, they'll never touch another cigarette. Once somebody knows that a moth is never going to hurt them ever again, their, their fear completely disappears. And so you, the, 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 the essence of being a good presenter of Enneagram is to give you the scenarios and for you, over the next few days, to think, oh, oh. And then once you've decided what that number is, and once other things start to 
fit into place. Even if somebody else said you were a five, you'd just know that you're not. And it, it's about how the information serves you from this point onwards. Yeah. When you recognise in yourself that you're descending, or you're recognising yourself, you're having a really good day and you're ascending and you've never felt so brilliant, you know, make a little mental note of those aspects. Yeah. Like, so if you've got someone, because I think my son is a nine, I think my eldest son is probably a nine, not that I'm any expert, but just from what you've been saying. So do you tend to gravitate to people that are the same number as you, or does it work the other way? How does that work? Yeah. Or do they actually I'm, wind you up because they're too much like you? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I get all the eights. I get all the eights because the the... The eights want to sa save the world and in this magnanimous way and they've, they've really put themselves forward and they're assertive and psychically they seek me out. Eights seek me out and I've called them in the book, lovingly, <laughs> the war one. I'm, I'm the peacemaker and they're the war one. So they're like saying, get off your arse Jenny, do something, we're going to do this. I've got people in Canada and America now seeking me out saying, yeah, you know all this stuff, come on, let's do this, do this. And it, I irritate them to the point of distraction after a while because I don't jump on the bandwagon and I'm wanting, I'm doing the unity thing and I'm, blah, 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 blah. and they're off at a tangent and I know they're going to have a fall and then they, they then, there's all sorts of instances where I thought, oh, oh, they're an eight. I seem to attract eights. And eights and nines together are brilliant because we balance each other out. Yes. Yeah. So, no, I don't think I've... Well, yes, I've met in my life two more, two other nines. Um, and it's, it's few and far between, I think, that you meet your own number. And I think that's kind of psychically designed. Because if you put, put all the nines together in a... There'd be no conflict, there'd be... Nothing much going on. We'd all, we'd all have a piece of cake. Get done. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in mixing it up, particularly in couples, particularly in couples, it's um, it's really interesting to mix it up. And I think it, it, you know that idea of opposites attract. Yeah. It, it's great in one sense when everybody's in a good mood but in another sense <sighs> but being a couple knowing the other person whether you know Enneagram or not somebody that loves you dearly knows how you're going to react when some bad news comes along and they're going to preempt that and if they're loving and supporting they'll kind of joke you out of it or they'll say something that would make you recognize you're kind of overdoing your personality in a sense and so you pull out because they'll, you'll allow them to say those things. Um, the beauty of being in a relationship is brilliant, whether or not you think it's fantastic or not. Having somebody else's point of view so you don't get completely self-absorbed and, and out of it, even if it is a kind of figurative slap across the face, it will give you another perspective on something. And you know, all these things are kind of in some way meant to be. So we're meant to be uh, jivvied up and stirred up and um, have these conflicts and um, mostly to reveal to ourselves how we trip ourselves up and how we can help another and ultimately help ourselves. Um, but it's all about interaction and rela everything. All life is about relationship because we're all, it's all meant that we come back together as a group soul. But we are very different aspects of it. But as soon as I knew about these nine types and fought against it, it was like the universe was showing me them everywhere. And I mean, the fours, goodness me. The fours are wonderful. I love fours. They're very creative. They're wonderful people. But every four that I've met at some point does turn against their rescuer, which is just exactly by the book. Because something is inherently, at a soul level, something is inherently wrong in the universe. Something needs to be fixed. There's some terrible thing that they've got to explore and, and that sparks a creativity which is wonderful. 
but because they want something to kind of not be right if you tell them everything is right and because I'm a nine that's what I do you know every, everything's wonderful optimistic <laughs> unity they'll argue the task and they'll turn against the rescuer if you make things all right if you have a child who's a four and moaning mine. teenager they're always oh this there's always something wrong. you fix that it's like the emperor's new it's like uh, a soldier soldier won't you marry me with your musket pipe and drum or your sweet maid i won't can't marry you i have no pipe to put on. and off she went to her grandfather's chest and bought him a coat of the very very best you know you keep doing things and doing things if you find you're always doing something to please somebody and they're never pleased yeah mm and you suddenly realise they're a four, you can relax because you haven't got to make it right for them because if you do make it right for them, they'll hate you because you've taken away their reason for living, you know? So they turn it in a certain way, you know, they turn against the person that's trying to do things right and it just saves you a lot of energy. You think, oh, they're a four. They're okay in their misery because it makes them create, you know? I and think it, I should just pay you for that information, Jenny. Make me a load of um, oh, work and effort. <laughs> 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 Maybe it wasn't 20 or 17 years ago. But yeah. yeah, that's it. You know, you suddenly think, because it, it's like a row of dominoes going clunk, 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 clunk. Oh. oh, and that's what Paula meant when we had that conversation last time on Zoom. <laughs> she, she liked it because Jenny kept saying, oh, there are four, oh, there are four. You know, to, to people I know and trust. And she'd go, what, what, what? <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. saves I a lot I get lots of fours for my way, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, oh, it's, it's amazing because if you suddenly figure somebody's number out, you get an insight into how you know they're going to behave when they're in a bad mood. And you kind, of, you kind of protect yourself from it. Or you kind of go, they're there, it's all right. <laughs> you kind of can say the right things. So I'll still be as authentic as you possibly can. But if you know they're descending, yeah. then you can kind of just, they'll be all right in a bit. You know, they just need this. I mean, um, with Gosha, I went through in the, at the back of the book. The uh, there's a, how to get along with me. You know, if I'm a nine, this is what I like. This is how to get along with me. You know, if I'm an eight, this is what I'm like. Always be authentic. You know, never lie to me. Never let me find out you've cheated. If I'm an eight, this is how to get along with me. If I'm a four, this is how to tell me I'm special. Tell me, no, 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 don't try and fix everything, you know? Yeah, so this is um, a really fun part of the book at the back is how to get along with me. And uh, I think it's just brilliant knowing this stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! I think that'll be uh, really useful. Um, I do seriously, I mean, I'm no expert, but I think my son is a four and possibly I'm a nine, and there is this constant, like, I'm trying to fix. Yeah. Piss him off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so it will be really useful to look at that dynamic. And I think that that is absolutely the key when you realise whether it's parent, child, or spouse, or friend. You know, if, if you and if you had a friend that you've had like for like twenty years, and you just know they're going to behave this way if that happens, or if you tell them this. But because they're your friend, and because you've been through such a lot, you know, you, you just let them sound off you let them because you just know it's, you're gonna be all right tomorrow if they fall out with you today it'll be all right next week you know because you know them but yeah. this it really really helps and i mean i did this little chart here i'm going to show you now but um as i said to you on our last zoom i've got the whole place covered in these <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was falling off. There we go. Um, mm. Yeah, the um, the um, numbers mm. either descend or ascend according to where you are on the chart. So once you've got your own chart, once you know, oh, I'm this number, 
and I go to this part and I go to and then there's the triads you either act from the gut the heart or the head because that's another thing without getting too much into it you know got all these chakras the chakra malarkeys mm. well yeah. back in the day there weren't seven there was three and it's all been refined we've evolved since so people would either act from the gut gut instinct knee-jerk mm. reaction or they'd act from the head from the intellect we must be able to think our way through this or they'd ask act from the heart mm. I feel so passionately about this we have to do it this way so you'd have head people heart people and gut people all living together in a cave <laughs> And they still had to get on because they all had to eat. Somebody had to go and catch the stuff. Somebody had to cook it, and uh, somebody had to be diplomatic and make sure everybody had enough. Mm. So we evolved, you see. So the the chakras and the sins, the seven deadly sins, and oh, it's all ended up being <laughs> how interesting. It all ended up being a way of assessing people. It's an interview in a posh office in the centre of the city. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you for letting me go on as long as I have. No, that's really interesting. Thank it's you. Wonderful. Thanks for giving us your time this close to Christmas as well. Oh, I've really mm. enjoyed it. That's why I put my jumper on. I've been wearing this for a <laughs> week already and I'm, I'm not taking it off. <laughs> <laughs> So do send me that link, Jenny, I and then I can share it. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yes. We go any questions? No, I just find it absolutely fascinating. So well, I'm always fascinated by how people work, how they tick. And I have, I am very much an observer. And I, I've even looked at, when I did training, because I've had loads of trainings, I even asked people what star sign they are. Mm. <laughs> and found out that way as well, because that's how fascinated I am by stuff like this. Oh, so yes. it's yeah. right down my alley. <laughs> yeah, and the whole numerology comes into it and the sacred oh. geometry and the Kabbalah. You know, it's all the same stuff, really. It's all energies being played out as if we're kind of, yes, we're affected by energies, but we, we also have free will. We, when we know ourselves, we can rise above the ego. We can do that because we are sentient beings. We've got frontal lobes now. You know, we can do this stuff. And so, yes, there's, there's that um, kind of soul urge to do things a certain way. But we don't always act in our best interests. And mm. uh, under duress, we can become a completely different person, a completely different number. You know, we well, can tell Jenny's out of sorts because she would never usually do this. You know, that's when, again, your good friends know when you've, let's say, they have a go at you and you, you know, oh, something's going on with them. Not that they're having, a, not, not that you'll get offended by them having a go, but, oh, I wonder what's wrong with them because they're not usually like this. You know? Mm. So that, that's the essence of all of this. And I'm really glad that you've enjoyed it and want to take it further because, um, yeah, it, it's it's amazing work, and um, it's going to serve you. It's going to really help in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Okay. Bye bye then. Thank nice to meet you all. Thank you. 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 Thank